But before being reunited with her family, she still has a mountain to climb. It's a big ask for a bird that can't fly, standing less than half a meter tall. But it's now that rockhoppers live up to their name. Incredibly strong toenails grip the rock. The beak makes a good climbing tool. The more experienced penguins make it look easy, but it's a steep learning curve. It takes youngsters a while to get the hang of it. Misjudge it. Back to square one. At the top of the cliff, the going gets a little easier. She's following the footsteps of generations forging deep tunnels through the tussock grass. These pathways connect around 20 different colonies spreading up the hillside. She's got to find her way through nearly half a million rock hoppers. But she knows where she's going, returning to the same colony each year. Unfortunately, that happens to be at the very top of the island. Finally, after a climb of two kilometers, she's made it. dinner. It's a messy business, but the chick's not complaining. The Arctic. Millions of square kilometers of empty ice. Polar bears are normally solitary. You might think that just finding a partner in this desolate landscape would be the challenge. But they have an excellent sense of smell and can detect another bear from over the horizon. Male bears can spend weeks tracking the scent of a female who's ready to mate. They sniff closely to size each other up. She'll raise her cubs alone, devoting herself to them for two, even three years. It's a huge commitment of time and effort. So it's vital to pick a male who will provide strong and healthy genes for her offspring. 
It looks as though she's going to put this potential suitor through his paces. She leads him up and down the slopes. It's as if she's testing his fitness. They start to play. Courtship is one of the few times that adult animals play together. This slope is rather steep for the heavier male. It's no good, he can't quite manage it. But she seems to have decided that he might be the one whilst he seems to have lost interest. It's her turn to do the chasing. And she's got a few tricks up her sleeve. That was enough to entice him up again. In this tree, there is one of the most extraordinary plant predators. It's one animal that I don't need to sneak up on. Boo! This extraordinary creature is half blind, half deaf, and this is just about as fast as it can move. That's what's going to happen to you if you live on nothing but leaves. It's a sloth. It's not exactly an enthusiastic leaf eater. A couple of half-hearted chews and the leaves go straight down to its stomach. Leaves, however, are not easily digested. The sloth's technique is to give them time. Then, eventually, this mobile compost heap pulls itself together and starts on a long and dangerous journey. This is a very unusual sight, a sloth in a hurry. It wants to defecate, and the only place it's happy doing that, oddly enough, is down on the ground. It only does it about once a week, but why does it come down to the ground to do it? And why does it nearly always choose to do so in exactly the same place? Whatever the reason, it must be very important, for a sloth on the ground is almost helpless. Any predator could attack it, and it doesn't have the speed to escape. Why it comes down in this way is a mystery. Nobody knows. Now he's finished, and back he goes up to the safety of the canopy. Leaves are not very nutritious. The sloth's way of compensating for that is not to eat more, but to do less. Its claws hook over the branches so that the sloth can hang without any effort of its muscles, which have been reduced to thin ribbons. And to save energy, it spends most of its time hanging around half asleep in the treetops. So, with very little muscle, and a reaction time only a quarter as fast as ours, how does a sloth's day compare with our day? In the time it takes me to write a few letters, the sloth just about manages to groom itself. 
While we have our lunch, the sloth nibbles a few leaves. And then, as we film the sequence for the series, it's time for another nap. Ying Hua, a three-month-old female. Abandoned by her mother after only a few days, she is being hand-reared. Pandas have twins 50% of the time, but choose only to keep the strongest. It's nature's survival of the fittest. Ying Hua wasn't chosen by her mum, so the nannies go out of their way to spoil her rotten. She has already outgrown her incubator and is piling on the pounds. Puppy fat on a baby panda is good. At 11 pounds, Ying Hua is filling out well. You need to know your panda's growing properly, so everything is weighed and measured. They're robust at this age, and a little bang is all part of the fun. When baby mammals are hand-reared, you have to do everything that mum does. And that includes encouraging them to wee and poop. In the wild, they can't do this on their own, so mum helps by licking their behind. Tapping Yinghua's back end is the next best option and simulates what panda mums do with their tongue to encourage going to the toilet. This will need to be done on each panda multiple times a day, pretty much after every feed. So when you count them all up, that's a lot of toilet training. With the herd staying in one place, our spy cams can be everywhere. Even a tree stump spies on the calf's every movement. <coughs> Boulder Cam was first used in a film that spied on lions. Now it finds a new generation to entertain. As always, the lion's first reaction is curiosity. But these cats are more inquisitive than most. One cub has taken to it in a big way. Boulder Cam doubles up as a baby walker. Thank you.